So I think they have to approve it on April 11th, it says. Um, the World Trade Center is 1,776 feet. Um, so it'll be it'll be 200 feet taller than the World Trade. So if you're looking for office space, Pete, hmm. that's where you want to. Is there a picture of it? Yeah, it's ugly. Of what it will look like? It will look like. I mean, what? No, you just, know what? It'll it'll look like everything in Lower Manhattan building, looks right now. Top. Yeah. They all look the same. Yeah. I was walking past the J.P. Morgan building today, and uh, that's the biggest thing I've ever seen. How many stories is that? That's going to be uh, 60, six zero stories, and it's going to be entirely electric, zero Jamie net I, emissions. Jamie Dimon at the top corner. Office. Jamie will sit on the 60th floor. the best floor. view. Yeah, probably. That's cool. Yeah. Um, wow, yeah. look at that rendering. That's Oklahoma City. Wow, that does. So you cool. can see on the bottom, there's some there's some sex going on yeah. there. Is that a pool? Don't we have tornadoes Wait, I think there? I see the food court. Yeah, the food I see court. it. It's right there. That's a uh, <laughs> Chang's it's Chick Fil A. Uh, J P Morgan Building is Park Avenue to Madison, 47th Street to 48th Street. Wow. It's a square city block. Yeah. It's one structure. Was that the where they when they took over the le the old Bear Stearns Building? Was it that location? Mm. That's still up. This That's is something still, else. Okay. This, this is right behind it, right? Yeah, this is 270. They're also in 383. I don't know. They're 383 in like, Madison. 383. Is the old yeah. Bear Building. Okay. And they, right, have, right, the, and they right. have the old J.P. Morgan Building, which is right on Park by, by Grand Central. Don't they have tornadoes in Oklahoma City? Not a weatherman, but. That's actually the building they got for three bucks, right? It wasn't quite three bucks, but yes. That, <laughs> the that Bear was, Stearns Building? Yeah. Yeah. That was the, that, most of the value. So when people are like, oh, Jamie Dimon's going to be the Treasury Secretary. Maybe he's going to run for president. Not until he sits his ass in that building. He has zero interest in getting to power. But I'm saying at a minimum, oh, I yeah. disagree. You wouldn't build. Yeah. You wouldn't. You wouldn't build something like that and not wait another year to sit in it. Definitely. And be the CEO and, sitting there. And host there. a lot of meetings. Have people come to your office. The existing, the existing uh, J.P. Morgan headquarters. They have a, for, they have a top floor thing. It's not outdoors. It's not a roof deck or anything. But they have the guns from Hamilton. Really. Like the actual, not from the Broadway show. Like, like, like the duel? They have type? Hamilton and Burr's guns in a case. Wow. And uh, they do like client events up there. It's pretty cool. They that have a whole bunch cool. of other shit up there. Like the actual ones that were used for that duel? Like the actual ones. Was uh, it yeah. Burr? Yeah, 1783. Yeah, Burr. Or something yeah. Like they're that. like behind glass, and then they have like all these historical documents. Hmm. And uh, I, they do, I don't know if they still do it. They were doing like an RIA event once a year. The asset management side. That's cool. So they would bring museum. you up there for cocktail cocktail party. Yeah. And uh, they have some shit up there. So That's uh, we're going to have that too. We're going to have Barry's guns. We're going to have the duel. His the, car collection? We're going to have the guns that Barry and John Malden uh, used to duel each other. I don't think there's uh, a building big enough 2011. for John's, John's gun collection. <laughs> we need a museum for Barry's cars. Uh, we do. We do. So I don't want to do the whole show about this, but I also can't let it go because I've never quite heard anything like this before. I want you guys to react to this. I love burning the short sellers. Like almost <laughs> sure nothing makes a human happier than taking the lines of cocaine and uh, <laughs> away from these short sellers who like are going short on a truly great American company, not just ours, but it just love pulling down great American companies so that they can pay for their coke. And I, the best thing that could happen to them is we will provide, we will lead their Coke dealers to their homes after they can't pay their bills. <laughs> and that that's like one of my- Surely all short sellers. Yeah, well, you know, go ahead, habits. do your thing, we'll do our thing. I love burning the short the, sellers. The, uh, like the Steve Jobs playbook. Almost nothing makes a human- All right, that is, uh, of course, Sarah Eisen interviewing uh, Alex Karp, who is the CEO of Palantir. What accent is, is that Philadelphia? Coke? Karp? So no, I handled that like your very coke, well. Your Coke dealer? Is that, is that not, to, not to offend anyone. I'm not sure. I have a Long Island it's accent. Like it's Upper okay. East Side, mid-1980s. No, it mid it's, no, it's either, I I, Duncan, what kind of accent is that? You know, uh, I, I have no idea. You know that part of the country. He was no? born in New York that City. Into an AI model told you. To tell us. Raised in Philly. <sighs> uh, are short sellers all on cocaine, Peter? I mean, Jim Chanos was not, <laughs> I don't believe. Besides him. Um, I mean, a good short that's seller insane. would never short a good company. Well, listen, it is Wall Street, so you never know. That's true. But that's an ins isn't that a red flag? If you're an investor, you hear your CEO talking like that? You never want to attack the shorts. That's crazy, right? Those that do are defensive for a reason, maybe. 
to, uh, I get why they would dislike the short sellers. Yes. But then to go and publicly say something like that. I'm wondering if he had a conversation just prior to that of a short seller criticizing who, who was on, his company. Who was on, he's, he's he's sort of, on coke. Uh, he seemed sort of fired up and ready his, to go uh, on his the anger, topic. maybe? I listen, we've, been, we've all been doing this for quite some time. We can list the number of people that have attacked short sellers. And with, with all due respect to Palantir and, and Mr. Karp, most of the people who've gotten defensive about short sellers have gotten defensive for a reason, and, and it hasn't I was going to say that, and then I was going to ask, have you ever spoken to a CEO of a publicly traded company off the like, like over a drink, uh, and the no. subject of short sellers comes up ever. Um, no. Uh, yeah. Okay. I think so. What and what was their what was their comment on the pe- on short sellers or the people shorting their well, stock? Well, no. Uh, the general view is that short sellers are uh, a plague on society. I think that's probably. So I've had different a different experience. Anytime I've ever spoken to a CEO and the topic of short selling has come up, which is maybe twice, but once very, very, very recently, the comment is, yeah, whatever, let them do what they're going to do. Like, we'll prove them wrong. We, not we hate them, not they do coke. It's like, it's like yeah, they exist. It's, it's like part of what sure. we do. Now, if you're like being chased down the street by short sellers, it's a little bit different, but you're probably guilty of something if that's the case. It's not my experience that shorts latch on to a company that's like mostly a, no, a great I think company. That, I think that's probably right. And, and that's the right response. Like is Tim Cook battling short sellers in the street? Well, how not big really. is the short interest in Apple? But because like it doesn't matter. It's only 4%. It's not even, it's not, I mean, it's has, not nothing. Has, but. Has, uh, has Elon said anything about the short sellers publicly? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, he has, oh, definitely. Yeah. He, you can he, Google that. He went one. after that was, a, that was a leading question. It was, he went after, <laughs> I, okay. There's also room to say, oh, short sellers are fine. Just the short sellers who are betting against my company. Sure. Those, those are the cokeheads. Those are always the cokeheads. <laughs> That's right. Uh, sh- we, we agree shorts are like a healthy part of the ecosystem and uh, will very often uncover things that no one else would. And uh, when, It's interesting. When you look at the stocks, you know, the people that go want to go long, they want to hurt the short sellers. They look for the highly shorted names. But – the most highly shorted names for a period of time, more often than not, they end up being right. Now, they may get killed before they're right, but their thesis on a particular story, more so than not, ends up being right. Have short time. sellers ever put a good company out of business? Of course not. No. No way. No. They never put a company out of business, but they reveal faulty business model or fraud How about this? that eventually does itself. How about this? If you're an investor or a CEO— at a company that's being accused of something by short sellers or just being generally um, disrespected by people that are shorting the stock. If you think you're right and the short sellers are wrong, they will eventually lose money and you will win. So they're almost, they're guaranteed buyers. Why would you be against that? Imagine if he was like, I can't wait to take their cocaine and snort all of it. I want the coke. (laughs) (laughs) Can I tell you one thing? You know what's a great example of what you just said, Pete? Uh, Valiant. Uh, Excuse me, Herbalife. Right. It really was a piece of shit after all. Have you looked at the stock lately? Yes. It's it in looks, single digits, right? It looks like it's going to zero. And Ackman actually tweeted on it uh, I saw just that, a few yeah. weeks ago. So that basically knocked him out of the investment short game maybe forever. Uh, I and mean, he forever. Ended up being right. forever is a long time. Forever is a long time. But that basically knocked him out of the game. It's an $8 stock. It's yep. probably where it belongs. Yeah. But to your point, it was so heavily shorted. And it took years to play and, it, out. and it took years. Does anybody want to invest that? That was way? like what, 2014? The Herbalife saga it was a lo- it was pro- probably a decade ago. Yeah, at least I would say. Uh the a Tesla short, if we had a Tesla short on the podcast right now, would probably point out, hey, not for nothing. Tesla's in a 50% drawdown. I know also, we're gonna talk also, about that. It took later. me a while, but also taking some time to happen. Yeah. Well, no, yeah. Tesla shorts were wrong. Uh we're we're gonna actually we're gonna I don't want to step on that because one. Because the Tesla later. shorts came out when I mean in the teens, right? Like twenty seven, whenever it was it. I feel like they've been around for as long but, as but this. The, the, the short Day on one. Tesla it sort of morphed. Originally it was That's like, true. oh Musk is but the original PT short thesis Barnum, was, was he can't it, deliver and he did right. deliver. And then he ended up delivering, and yeah. then it became a valuation thing. Yes, it's a car company. No, it's not a right. something else company. No, no, no. The fundamental thing that happened was that the crowd behave differently than the short sellers thought. Right. All right, of the yeah. stuff about the company running out of money was true. The short sellers assumed that a secondary stock offering would be a negative catalyst, but crowd psychology went the other way. Yeah, shareholders could have They said, up. they said, 
oh, now it's definitely not going out of business. Look, they just raised a billion dollars. So right. I don't know if you yeah. heard Einhorn on, uh, I forget what recent podcast he just did. Barry. Uh, he did Barry. Oh, was yeah, it with Barry? Barry yeah. Where yeah. he was talking about the- um, he doesn't do a lot of. Po- By the way, he no, he does not. Never. Uh, but he was talking about the change in the market landscape yeah, over Barry. the last. It's called short sales and cars with Barry Holtz. Was that <laughs> short, short sales, sales and cars? And cars. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that probably should be the name of the podcast today. It's fascinating, Michael. Yeah. Yeah. Intriguing, but uh, but, it, but his point huh. is that that as a value investor, you can, for anyone who's listening and, and didn't hear the podcast with Barry, that the landscape used to be that as a value investor, as a short seller, you could expose X or undercover Y, and uh, and the market would care. The market yeah. would care and come around to your view. And because of the growth of passive investing and other memifications, which which some of which he touched on, some of which he didn't, you can't rely on that anymore. And for for years, if Danny Moses was on the podcast, he'd say that was the problem for Tesla. Obviously, something changed. Uh, sometime in 22, and, and that behavior has been different. Here's what I would say. I think he has it backwards. Um, with all due respect to Mr. Einhorn, and it was an awesome interview. I think there was a period of time that was the aberration, a 10-year stretch, where you could go to Iris own, you could lay out all of these terrible things about a company for all to see. The stock would halt and then open down 20%, and that was the aberrant period. I think for most of history— Eventually, bad companies were revealed and stocks fell, but shorts didn't have that loud of a voice. Like, I don't think in the 1980s and 90s, there were like these short stories that would go viral within minutes and, and stocks would blow well, up. When was Bill Fleckenstein around? That was- Early 2000s. Ni- mid-90s. Or mid-90s? Into the late 90s. But could he crush a stock with a speech? No, and he- There was no he, Twitter. Yeah, and he he never he never actually did that. He wasn't necessarily a vocal so one. Her, so Herb Greenberg would write a column yeah. about a $3 billion market cap piece of shit. Right. It would maybe fall 5 or 10% and then reverse right. Tops, no, I'm just right. kidding. Uh, or Dan Dorfman would <laughs> yeah. run a story. But so, but so this- Who fund? Tice, maybe? David Tice. David Tice. Tice yeah. David Tice, that's yeah. right. Uh, but so my point is, I think it's a very compressed period of time where the shorts had this power- to really knock down a stock with a speech or a tweet or or a presentation. And that's not, like, we weren't going to revert back to that. We've reverted instead back to this thing where most people don't care what a short seller has to say. They, they probably don't even hear it. But wait, but I think, but Einhorn's point wasn't on the short side. He was basically saying that good investing is about people agreeing with you later. And in these smaller cap companies where he's finding value, if nobody ever agrees that there's value yet because there's less active managers, then those stocks will never see their value. And I think that, that was his main But the point. shorts, like the shorts are nailing these trades in solar right now. I don't know if you've seen any and of these shorts. And EVs trades. too. And EVs. And EVs. With Fisker. The shorts, the shorts have been patient. They've been right. These are not great business models. These companies are not sustainable. Solar Edge looks like it's going to zero. Look at uh, Sunrun. Look at ChargePoint. Nova. Yep, EVgo. Oh my God. ChargePoint is $2. Under. Under. Yeah, all, Riv, uh, all Rivian. The, Rivian. The funny thing about the, ch- the the charging companies, EVgo, et cetera. Blink. Blink going, going. I got killed in charge point pers- on the long side, of the, course. The amount of money that's been spent so far, there's been $100 billion spent out of all these different government spending programs. Virtually all virtually all of them. I'm overreacting. But, but 75% of the money that's been allocated so far has been for EV charging and or battery infrastructure. And so an enormous amount of money has flowed to these names and to this idea, and yet none of them can figure out how to make money. Although I maintain to the to the, uh, to the laughing stock of people at Solus that in 20 years, 25 years, gas stations will not be a thing, and you'll just pull up to Starbucks, and there'll just be a charging station. I got right one more. That's a question. There's a worse hybrids, outcome than that. Be gas stations. The we, roof is a solar cell. Sure. Take off. The roof of the car is a solar cell, and nobody stops ever. Well, then you still yeah, don't need gas possible, stations. Yeah. Which is not, we're not ready for that now. What about convertibles? Uh, nobody drives convertibles. There, there's two cars <laughs> already that have solar, solar roofs. Fisker has one, and then Aptera right. is doing one. So it's very – you can't power a car for 300 miles on an afternoon's worth of sun. But, of course, that's where they're going to try to get to. I don't know if it's 20 I, – I wouldn't know. But – This also highlights, like, two different types of short sellers. One that says, this is a broken business model. I'm going to short it. Or this is a fraud. I'm going to short it. Versus like the hedge fund that does relative value trades. I'm going to go long this. I'll short that. Right, right. You know, yeah, they're different. not looking for that. They're just looking for one to outperform the other. Uh, you know, the Chanos obviously being the broken business model, the fraud or whatever. I mean, I think Chanos looks for both, right? Like he looks for companies that it's a fraud because what they're saying is not possible. 
Like there, like there's no way this company could well, ever be profitable based on right. this, so, the fraudulent statements they're making. Therefore, or ever realize this valuation. Right, right, right. Sure. With I mean, that's the, fun, the fundamental, fundamental argument there is that in order for a given company trading at X ratio, whichever one you pick, you'd have to assume twenty uh, percent sales growth indefinitely. You'd have to assume ninety percent market share, or whatever it might be. Right. What? What? Who's the? Who's the? Um, the 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 short seller guy who comes out and he has positions in his own shorts. Um, uh, block. Um, Muddy Waters. Muddy Waters. Yeah. Uh, like Muddy Waters block? is much more yeah. trying to find yeah. outright fraud. And he has. That is an incredibly. Didn't to Muddy his Waters credit. find a Sino Forest? Yes, he yes. did. Do you know how many like high flying um, blue chip hedge funds were long Sino Forest? Yeah. Just like nobody bothered to like fly over there and say, is there even a forest? Did he also find Lucky Coffee? Uh, that's uh, a good the, question. Yes, I'm not I sure. The, His the, most recent short is actually will be interesting. Uh, Blackstone Mortgage REIT. Sure. As B, as what? B how reed, short, short, short not B reed. reed the uh. the uh, the mortgage REIT. That's the BXMT, mm. which is a play on or a short play on on office commercial real estate, and that they're over their skis. They can't cover their dividend. That was his argument that he made on TV uh, a couple that's months ago. That's not priced in already. Like isn't isn't that thing probably sure the thing's destroyed already? No. Right. Well, that's that's a, a short from a macro, well, three and a half sort of a macro call. Does that pay a big yield? And well, that's the thing. They, so it's a negative a good carry. yield. He's got a tough carry. Yeah, yeah. That's a tough short to carry it, for too long. I was going to say the labor in, intensiveness to find fraudulent companies oh. is just and off the, the mental charts. stress. Well, so that's what's so funny. Like real professional short sellers will do that work, and then you have this like amateur class of short sellers who think like, oh, I just wake up and buy puts on NVIDIA. Yeah, but that's not- Because right. yeah. it went up a, a lot. Yes. <laughs> that's just like rolling the yes. dice. By the way, well, my, my comment is if you're not a professional short seller, you should you have no business playing a game that people like dedicate their whole lives to playing. Right. The, the yep. Blackstone you know? uh, stock has a 12% yield. The stock? Yeah, BXMT. It's a big cost Oh, oh okay. I thought, you, I thought you meant just uh, BX. No, not BX. BX. Okay. We ready to go? Yes? All right. Oh man, what a what a lineup today! This is like a dream. Is this like a dream team? Is this going to be a big one? Could this be the best pot of all time? Probably not. Probably not. To be honest, five out of ten. <laughs> Today's episode is brought to you by Franklin Templeton, manager of 70 plus ETFs in the U.S., including EZBC, the Franklin Bitcoin ETF. Josh, in ETF land, they like to try to have memorable tickers. I think they nailed it with EZBC because the spot Bitcoin ETF gives investors an easy way to get exposure to Bitcoin without having to worry about private keys, digital wallets, and all that stuff. That's right, Michael. And I'll tell you something else. EZBC has zero fees. They've waived it to zero until August of 2024. That's followed by the lowest ongoing fee of 19 basis points. We had a guest from Franklin Templeton recently who reminded us that the firm has a 75-year history of innovation. They've actually had big digital assets focus and presence since 2018. They've been building blockchain-based technology solutions, developing a range of investment strategies, and running node validators. They launched the first U.S. registered mutual fund to use public blockchains to process transactions and record share ownership. Really cool stuff from a firm with a solid footprint and trusted legacy in traditional finance. Learn more about Franklin Templeton's ETF lineup and EZBC at franklintempleton.com. If you're listening via podcast platforms or on YouTube, please see the link in the description for more information. This one right there in the fairway. I've had it with your negativity today. <laughs> It's spring. The sun is shining. Manhattan is packed. It took me an hour to get here from uh, New York Stock Exchange. No one told you to take a car. Uh, I took the subway yesterday. You saw me do it. You saw me I do got, it. Actually, I did. I got, on the, I got on the five train. I, how are you still taking trains in Manhattan? I get, let me give you my Yelp review on Wait, the five train. Wait, how are you still taking cars? <laughs> You're still taking cars in Manhattan. Excuse me, SUVs. Do you understand my stature on CNBC? SUVs only. It would never send an MKX. It would never send an MKX. What a waste of time. All right. Hey, put my music back up. Listen, guys, last week, the show hit number six on the investment uh, podcast chart for America. I wanted to tell you we love you. If you like the show, if you're a fan of the show, shout out to everyone who's been listening since day one. If this is the first time you've ever heard the show, shout out to you as well. To the haters, we will be here forever. Haters. Do you understand that? <laughs> Forever! We have a, Nicole, we ever gonna stop? Not a chance. All right, today's show, 
I've been looking forward to this for a long time. It's a family affair, <laughs> it turns out. Uh, <laughs> Dan Greenhouse is the chief economist and strategist at Solus Alternative Asset Management. Solus manages over $3 billion for institutions and family offices, specializing in event-driven, distressed, and special situation investment opportunities. Dan, welcome back to the show. Thank you, as always. And you brought your cousin. <laughs> Not technically my cousin, okay. but... Uh, Peter Bookfar is the CIO of Bleakley Financial Group, an RIA with over $9 billion in AUM. Peter also manages a global macro and income strategy for clients. Peter Bookfar, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Josh. Thank let's you, clear Michael. This up. Let's clear this up, though. Hold on. Is this a big one? <laughs> what? Is this a big one? It's a episode big, 134. A one. What? 134? One podcast. I, this I, might be the biggest one we've ever done. I don't think it's the biggest one you've ever done. It really is. You know why? You, you two guys... Uh, you two guys are two of the smartest people I know. I, I know I've told you both that. Uh, I've told you that. Off the Thank air. You. So this is Thank not you. just a thing that I say, right? And, I, and how often have I repeatedly said, we are two of the smartest people that you, you know? You have always agreed with me. <laughs> yes. You have always agreed with me. We are glad me. to be here. But no, but like, what's the, what's the relationship? And Nothing. When he, hired, he hired me. I trained under him and I owe my entire life to him. And his no, cousin is my wife. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> his cousin is my wife in addition. Wait, I did Well, that. I didn't know Peter hired you. Yeah. My first job, my first real job was working in the, what became the equity strategy group at, at Miller Tabak. Me, Dan, and Tony, Tony Crescenzi. Crescenzi. What year is this? Oh, Crescenzi. Mid 2000s. It, it was Tony, Tony, me, and Peter sat on the desk next to each other just yelling. You were and like screaming. right out of college? Uh, no, a couple of years later, but yes, early, mid mid to early 20s. So how did you find Miller Tabak or how did they find you? Well, I knew uh, Peter. Yeah. I, I said, I said to like, my wife. Because you're related. Yeah, you I said to my wife. Junior. So you're at the, all right, looking so you're for at the somebody. Why are you really the driving the nepotism yeah. angle here? And I said, you know what? I, I think Dan would be, I think Dan would be great. And okay. everyone's like, you know, hiring family. You never know how that's going to work out. I yeah. said, he's a big boy. If it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. And he's also very bright. And it's worked out. I would have cried and really complained, probably sued. Yeah. But it did work out because I'm that good. All right. Well, you deserve it. You deserve all your success. We love, uh, we love having you on the show. Um, what's the relation? Whose wife? Your wife? Again? Oh, my his gosh. Wife. Right. Really? <laughs> I just want to make sure it's not blood, is my point. My wife bled with him. Your wife bled with him. Yes. But you two. Yeah. Okay. Through just marriage. really great friends. <laughs> just really good friends. Okay. Uh, I've heard both you guys talk about this. When Wall Street people talk about inflation, it's a very technical definition that has to do with a comparison over last month. It is not the same way that regular people mean it when they talk about inflation. And I've had a bunch of reminders of this recently at various get-togethers with regular non-Wall Street people, really smart people, just not people that speak the same language that we do. Well, we speak month over month. They speak from three years ago. Yeah, so- Well, they speak anecdote. They speak three years yeah, ago, right. There's yeah. like a whole list of reasons, but they are not talking about the pace right, that's of right. the rise in that's prices. The level. They're talking about- like what it costs to live right now, regardless of what the pace is. So the, wor is. the word you would use is anchored. Um, these yeah. people in general, and if we throw up the chart that I brought, these people are anchored to pre-COVID levels. Why is that? Because they're normal people and they're not economists. And so this, this for <laughs> no, instance- No, but what is it about pre-COVID? Because well, it was just that's 2%. before prices started really going up. So this chart right here, this is the actual CPI. It's awful. So when you hear yeah. prices are up 3% year over year, this is the underlying index that is up 2%, 5%, 9%. And you can see, I, I put it starting in, in 2000 through 2020, it's a, we can complain about the rate and whether this is correct or not, but it was a nice steady upward slope, more or less. And nobody, and nobody complained. Because right. it's steady and you understand. Yeah. No surprises. And, that's right. And then all of a sudden you see the step function up and to this moment now, the CPI, which is the total basket of goods that someone might purchase, is up roughly 20% from that pre-COVID levels, which is a very rapid pace of increase. Cumulative. Cumulatively up and 20%. how many, like, let's say we had stayed at the steady pace of inflation that we had been on for two decades. Sure. How many years worth of inflation did we just pull into two years? Uh, that's probably seven to eight years. Right, we I'd had, have to go back and look well, exactly. Well, but well, well, since Eight years worth of inflation in two years is crazy. Since, since 2020, CPI is up about 19%. So three, call it four years. So Four years, okay. Yeah. That's a little. But th this shows you, though, also that and you can stretch this back to the, since World War II, yeah. you know, inflation's never transitory. It's just a rate of change, that is. But that said, goods prices, inflation is actually transitory. And now it's, and now it's disinflationary. So the 20 years side. leading into COVID, core goods prices averaged zero. Yeah. 
Hmm. It was services that's always up, whether it's sending your kids to camp, it's concert tickets, it's well, that sporting makes sense, goods, it's stuff rent, it's health care, it's education. Right. And that's when technology comes in and, and, and production efficiency and globalization and low cost wages out of China that helped keep price. It was services inflation that offset the zero and got to the one to 2% aggregate trend. So and, two observations on that. Um, when you back to this, this idea though, when you talk to people, first of all, they don't distinguish between goods and services. No, Th they don't care it's about their it. cost of living. That's because well, for, for the average, for the average person, inflation is the price of food at the supermarket and gas to put in the car, yes. more or less. I mean, yes. obviously other things uh, are involved, but. Uh, babysitter. My babysitter uh, just, wants $30 an hour now. It used to be 20. Right. That's like, right. That's, that's you know. right. So so just to get, to get back to your point, I think that one of the big problems you have in, in society in general right now in the United States, and we can tie this into politics for a moment, when you see like the current administration, for instance, saying the unemployment rate is at a multi-decade low and the economy is booming and we're creating hundreds of thousands of jobs a month, why are people so dissatisfied? I think that chart is at the 100%. core I think that's of, exactly of this right. disconnect between how people feel because they're looking, they go to the supermarket and they spend $120, $125 at the supermarket instead of spending $100 a year ago or two years ago and they haven't been able to move well, past Well, and it. imagine hearing hearing uh, economists say inflation is normalizing. They're like, what the f*** are you talking about? Uh, so they you, think in well, terms of levels. Only not, rising 3%. I'll tell you one better. Let's say we got a CPI print next month that was 0%. Let's say. And then the Biden administration put put Goolsby on TV, or what's the other guy, Jared Bernstein? It would, it would, it'd be Bernstein. Put, put Bernstein on TV, and Bernst, uh, Goolsby's in the Fed now. He's out with the okay, Fed. so they put Bernstein on TV, and he says actually inflation is is flat. Uh, people would say, "What on earth are you talking about?" That's one. Two, be careful what you wish for, because if people really want to roll back prices to 2019. What that would imply You're is maybe a, a 12% unemployment rate. It would, so right. you probably don't want uh, prices to go back to where they were. So, you just want them to stop rising. So to that point, real quick, just throw up the table, the, the, the table I brought after the chart. That's a good one. Um, I, I, again, just to reemphasize this point, this is a survey, and there's any number of surveys you could point to, but this is a survey from YouGov when asked, and this is the end of last year, when asked, what would you like to see to improve the economy? Two-thirds of respondents in the survey said oh, wow. actually lower prices. And it, and the important point to make, and make and then please go, is to Peter's point about going back to World War II, prices in general never go down. Some things go down. Hold on. 64% of people want lower prices? Yes. 20% of people want higher wages? Yeah. Well, they're getting the higher wages. They ain't never getting the lower prices. That's right. And and again, to, to the point. So, yeah, that, that, that is a problem. But this also gets to the fallacy of, of a 2% inflation target by the Fed is, thank God for technology, prices usually fall. So if technology prices are keeping a lid on goods prices, and that's zero, then something else has to rise by 4% to get to the two. Yeah. So Jay Powell actually is rerouting for higher other prices to offset that decline, natural decline in prices from technology. And that makes no sense. Yeah. What what should they be doing? Well, the reason why there's a 2% inflation target is not because an econometric model spit that number out and said, oh, this is ideal for the economy. It actually was a selfish reason because the Fed says, well, if inflation's at two, ideally we would have a Fed funds rate of call it at four. And if we go into recession, we'll have 400 basis points to cut in a downturn. That's where the 2% comes from? That's where the, that's the thought process behind a 2%. It's not because it's right for the economy. It's right for their own policy. That's wild. Does anyone really know? Does anyone really understand that? No. Uh, Does anyone no, in the Fed say that out loud? No, I don't think this is like a hidden secret. I think that, listen, there, this is behind the argument, well, should we make the inflation target 3%? Should it be 1%? The fact that you're even having that conversation, to Peter's point, uh, sort of a, a, gives away the, the ghost, so to speak, that there is no academic literature that says 2% is the right, the right target. Not to be clear, they do think 2% greases the wheels of the economy. You want a steady, modest upward rise in inflation so people go out and spend. And it's now there are a lot of people, by the way, who would say the right level of inflation is zero. The joke that I uh, heard, the joke that I heard is why is it 2%? So, like, why isn't it 3%? Well, 3% would be too high. Sure. Okay, yeah. what about 1%? No, 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 that would be way too low. Yeah. That's why it's too. But they like the, the price of their technology <laughs> products going down. Yeah. But people aren't aren't changing their spending habits at all. We got retail sales today. Slight miss, but people are it still spending. It depends on where you are on the income spectrum. The lower income consumer is definitely within a very tight budget and are having no Is that no not choice. always the case, though? Well, it is, but it seems like it's more so now. 
because of the cumulative rise in inflation relative to their wages. I'm not saying that they're partying, but if you if but if you look at uh, demographics and income and real wages, like people on the lower end, actually for the first time, I don't know if it's ever got large real wage increases. That's why Definitely. inflation is high, though. They are the they are the cause. Yeah, of the higher true. inflation. Yeah. You're going to set Peter off right <laughs> well, now. Well, no, no, it's true. They like, are 100% the reason this higher inflation. If you're a restaurant, you don't have all these productivity levers to pull to offset higher wages. You only have one, and that's to raise that cheeseburger from five to seven because you got to pay your staff more. So yeah. where, where you don't have the productivity ability to offset higher wages, you have no choice but to raise prices if you can get away with well, it. Well, let me, let me just say real quick. Yeah. Uh, to, to your point, so first of all, uh, just look at the chart of TJX and Ross stores. I mean, they're obviously, uh, th- this is, these are retailers that cater to lower income or medium income consumers. They're doing incredibly well for a reason. And I know you just had Mc- McDonald's yesterday. Dollar Tree disaster. By the way, uh, yes, Dollar Tree was was not great. And McDonald's was speaking at the UBS retail conference yesterday and said lower income consumers is constrained. Yeah, I hear a lot of these, I hear a lot of these anecdotes over time. I fall back on a company like Visa, and I, we mentioned this on air the other day. Monster. Visa sees everybody always doing everything. Every and every level. Every everything. Yes. And, and what's their CEO saying? And, they, are, uh, and, and every conference call, I find them to be one of the most informative, and, and it's a must listen. For, and in the last quarter, they said they see basically no weakness anywhere. Now, again, that's not to say that the lower income consumer isn't more challenged than the medium or higher income consumer. I think that's that's clearly Bank of America says the same thing. But, but – oh, please, I – no, no. Uh, but 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 to me, I think when you when a visa is a catch-all to account for idiosyncratic issues at Visa or Dollar Tree, et cetera, et cetera. Visa sees everybody everywhere and says everything. And if fine. the consumer is trading away from McDonald's and going to Taco Bell, Visa sees the spend. That's right. Yeah, I totally agree with that take. The only thing with, with Visa and Mastercard is that they're also benefiting from the secular move of people just using their credit card. So yes. if more people, the less people are using cash. That's I mean, true, so. I barely have any cash in my pocket. My son doesn't. I don't even know. Has You're a, just saying that so you don't get mugged when you go outside. I, I, I'm just. <laughs> no, my kids leave like, the house with a credit card. They right, carry so more no people cash. People are ever. also using. So um, yeah. now, also they're also pri- prioritizing where they're spending their money. Uh, they're they're spending less on stuff around the house and other things, but they're spending more on going out for dinner and. So it also is a shift in how they spend. Ally, like that's been Bank of America, years. New York, New York Fed. You have to work pretty hard to find real pockets of weakness. Auto delinquencies are not going in the right direction, but there's always something. But generally speaking, think the consumer is doing quite well. But you also have to inflation adjust. Like Brian Moynihan never inflation adjusts his comment on the consumer. He says, yeah, consumer's fine. Retail sales are up. You know, our sales are up 4%. Well, inflation's up 4% too. Yeah, the price is up. Right. Okay, but to, to that point, throw up the chart I brought, uh, the Bank of America chart. Um, Brian Moynihan at the Bank of America Financial Services comment. He's made a comment like this in the past, but at the Financial Services comment, and I could be screwing it up a little bit, the next one, that's that's not the one, I apologize, um, said, pre-COVID, our lowest bank consumer had somewhere around $3,000 in their checking account. The, the, this one. The consumer had somewhere between two and $5,000. The lowest bank consumer had somewhere between two and $5,000 in their checking account. Today, that peaked at somewhere around $13,000 and is, uh, well, pre post COVID was somewhere around $13,000, is today somewhere around $12,500. Uh, $12, so it's still elevated relative so this to cons- what it you, used we, to be. We all hear on CNBC all the time excess savings, excess savings. Still there. Here's Bank of, much like my point about wages Visa. Are higher. My po- Bank of America is a catch all for everybody. Yeah. And here's a chart from Bank of America, not not Brian Moynihan's comment from a different division, the Bank of America Investment Institute, I this think. This is savings and checking balances, this right? Is this is not anecdotal. Che- no, this is actual right, right. amount. So Brian Moynihan, one of the biggest retail banks in the country, is telling me that the lowest bank consumer has four times as much money still in their checking account today than they did pre-COVID. And, and that, along with the net worth chart that I brought, tells me the consumer is going to be just fine. This is Bank of America's economist, Aditya Bave, I want to say. Aditya Bave. Okay, you know you know the individual yes. in question. Okay, uh, not pop- personally. We're not we're not not like me and Peter. That I mangled. Uh, <laughs> not married to my cousin. I mangled the name. <laughs> uh, but the push and pull between goods and services is also really interesting. Um, you could have a company that's effectively a goods selling company, talking like recession is obvious, and then on the other side of the the, the household balance sheet, no, they're just spending differently. And we saw that with travel versus flat screen TVs last year. Um, this, this is, uh, from a new report on the retail, uh, spending front, the ongoing weakness in nominal retail spending is 
partly for, quote, good reasons, namely broad-based deflation in goods categories, which is Peter, what Peter is talking about, we've been seeing since 2023. However, another reason seems to be that strong services inflation is weighing on retail's wallet share. So in the CPI report, core services inflation came in at 5.2% year over year, which is smoking hot. Core goods printed negative 0.3%. So that's that push and pull, and you're seeing that here in the chart. It's not that money isn't being spent. It's not that there isn't inflation. Where the inflation is is moving or at all times. It's always shifting. Right. And even you listen to the calls of Royal Caribbean, Live Nation. Yeah. They see not one speck of consumer spending weakness, not at all. Yep. But yes, to your point, you listen to uh, Mohawk, which makes carpet. And you listen to even William Sonoma, which had a great execution. Have you seen the quarter. chart of William Sonoma recently? Right, no. they had a great throw that up. Yeah, they had a great execution. Oh quarter, my god! But they did talk about, hey, we sell home stuff, and home yeah, stuff's uh, a little the rest, soft. Yeah, the restoration guys been screaming yeah. for three quarters now. So right. you know, it's like you think you're in two different economies. Yes, and that's and that's something that uh, that's the problem with anecdotal analysis of the economy. The last person you hear speak sticks with you, but. And it's impractical to listen to 500 conference calls. No, and that's why I, I, I talk a lot about the Visa call or um, Walmart and Target because they, right. like, there might be a problem at Williams-Sonoma, but Williams-Sonoma does in a quarter what Walmart might do in, in a day or a week or obviously I don't know the numbers offhand. but And it's uh, hyper-specific. And it's hyper-specific. It's like ca cast iron pans for millionaires. But listen, that's, we, that's we, not the economy. We, <laughs> uh, many normal people, non-millionaires, have cast iron no, pans. No, but like just, who's the core <laughs> customer of RH? That, yes, well, RH is probably- $27,000 couches. An, an upper income bracket retailer. But but getting back to the main point, I, 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 I mean, I can't emphasize enough. If you scroll Twitter or you listen to financial don't do, TV- Don't do that. I, I know. Uh, the, the, the constant fear-mongering about the consumer about to break- is is to Peter's point. It's you can go. A, I wouldn't say it's BS, but you can go across industry, and you cannot find any really uh, any CEO or investor relations team talking about any material weakness really anywhere. It's it's really spectacular. One place, New York Community Bank. That's it. New York Community <laughs> Bank. But, but also the, the <laughs> high ranking consumer yeah. is benefiting from five percent money market rates. Right. If they have savings. Which I think was an underrated component of the economy staying strong in 23. We forgot when you have like, I don't know how many millionaires are in the United States. Your hand is very close to mine. <laughs> Seven million, eight, uh, 10 million, however many, when their bank accounts are gushing income, it's like a, it's a mindset shift. There, they there, just feel more than wealthier. Ten, there's more than, there's what, $6 trillion in money market funds. Yeah. That was yielding- Zero is now a couple of years is ago. now yielding real money. Yeah, hey, I want to ask you guys this: Is today uh, a pivotal moment in the market? So we got PPI coming in hotter than expected. You have the ten year up quite a bit, uh, the two year as well, and regional banks are down three percent. Small caps are getting crushed as they always do when the market is going down. Is today the day that the market says maybe they're not going in June either? I don't know that I would go so far as to say they're not going in June, and I've I've been in the June camp for for many months. Um, I, I think clearly the the listen to, to to take a step back. A lot of what we're talking about here is basically saying the economy is doing fine. So why cut? Why, why cut? Um, and I think that has to be your your starting position for this conversation. Um, that said, their view is you, you brought up Gretzky the other day, or maybe it was Wapner. Um, if inflation continues to decline, and, and January and February notwithstanding, the assumption is that it does continue to decline. And at, at this moment, I would implore people to look at the PCE when talking about the Fed and not the CPI. But if inflation continues to decline into the mid twos, they're going to feel comfortable at some point over the summer, probably at least beginning the process of reducing rates by one here, one there. But but just a, a point I couldn't wait to come on here and make is I don't like who cares. Uh, whether they cut in, in June or they cut in September or they cut in May. Well, the, the two-year cares, and we learned yes, today the 10-year cares. If you're an investor in the short end of the curve yeah. or the Fed Fund Futures market or the Euro dollar market, sure. But I assume most of the listeners to this podcast are buying stocks, uh, maybe buying corporate bonds. They're pretty bonds. much only buying NVIDIA at this the, point. So. In, fine. So they're buying right. NVIDIA. The, 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 this conversation about the Fed, is it's fun and it's important. But from an investment standpoint, if the economy is doing what we're all saying it's doing, that wins out. 
about. Stronger revenue, stronger earnings growth wins all the time. And I look, totally agree. Look no further than not, the market. I'm not rooting for weak economic data so that right. I get a rate cut. This conversation about I don't good understand is bad. the mentality. I, I don't, good is yeah. always good. I'm with you on that. And too good? Come on. How long can anything ever stay too sure. good? We haven't had too good in quite some time. Or if well, we have too no, good, it doesn't we do. last long. Now yeah. we do. The market's up 16 or 19 weeks. Everything is elevated. Like the stock market might not ever look, not ever. The stock market looks damn good. Are right you now. saying stocks have reached a permanently high plateau? I'm no, I'm not saying anything <laughs> of the sort. But that is that the bear case right now? That the, 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 bear, uh, that the, bulls, the bears have disappeared? The bear case is that financial conditions aided and abetted by the stock market have now eased so much that the Fed's next move might be another 25 basis point hike. Bears have disappeared. And if that happens, and I, I, that's not my view, you're getting a 10% correction like overnight. If the Fed even hints that, hey, cuts you on the table, but also maybe hikes too. So is anybody seriously suggesting that the next move is, is a rate yes. hike? Yes, people are? Yes. I'm, yeah, st I'm I, starting I to hear it. I think they stay where they are. I think we, we have to shift our, shift our focus to the balance sheet. And I say that because QE was such an effective tool in, in you know, igniting animal spirits in the markets. I mean, Bernanke himself said, you know, we want to lift asset prices because then that lifts wealth effect and that then consumer spending and so on. So it is a policy initiative to raise stock prices when you do QE. QT hasn't mattered because there's it's been offset by Nvidia. This money coming out of this reverse repo facility, which has it's been, been offset two by trillion GPU dollars, sales. And, and 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 Nvidia as well. So QT actually dollar for dollar starts to matter in the next couple of months. Could so you tell people where we see. stand with with uh, the Fed's balance sheet, what they've done so far to reduce it, and what the guidance is? So they've shrunk it about one point by one point three trillion ish, give or take. On a on a on, on a stock a, on of what? Almost a nine trillion dollar balance sheet. No, no, okay, not nothing. Right, but the this reverse repo facility that didn't exist a couple of years ago, it, they created it because there was so much QE overflow, like the money needed to go somewhere, and they created this new facility to sort of park excess money there, and that's actually shrunk by two trillion dollars. When I say shrunk, meaning money markets have a choice: do I take my dollar and park it at the Fed overnight, or do I buy a one month T bill or a three month and six month? Take what a interest bit are they getting rate. by parking at the Fed? They're getting, I think it's 5.3 or 5.4. Yeah, it's 5.33. Versus yeah, what they could get on a T-bill, well, which right now would be roughly- Somewhat similar. But they yeah. may say, you know what? I'm willing to take a, some duration because if the Fed cuts rates, I'd want to buy a six-month T-bill. So two trillion is- Now, so if I decide to buy a T-bill instead of parking at the Fed, well, that's sort of money that's that dollar is getting injected into the financial markets. Again, re-injected. Yeah. So that's right. offset the, sh the shrinkage in the Fed's balance sheet. Now that that facility is down to like 450 billion- now it's getting to the point where QT may actually matter from an oh, asset price perspective. And I've always, like, the hardest thing in, in investing is to try to figure out what's the right P-E ratio. Well, wait, can we back up? So the Fed saying, so the Fed engaging in quantitative tightening while simultaneously doing trillions of dollars in reverse repo well, well, it's like jumping out of a window with a parachute on. Like what? Like well, what? well, that's the thing. Yeah, the money's the Fed's been taking money out. The Fed, money market funds have been putting money back in. Right, and the money coming back in has offset what the Fed has tried to tried to do. So I don't fully buy this, but but uh, just, just put don't it, talk to your cousin like that. Yeah, <laughs> uh, a three month T bill by the way is five thirty eight, and I think you get five thirty three on um on the, on the the temporary reverse so with rebounds. billions of dollars that difference matters well if yes i yeah, mean there's a the effective fed funds yeah but there's a there's a liquidity argument uh fr from a money management standpoint like it's worth it to me to be in an overnight facility if i lose a couple of basis points just to know that i have access to that money whereas obviously not that a treasury isn't perfectly liquid it's just not as liquid as cash and if there's one thing um that we've seen in the post covid environment it's that that small little bit of liquidity management matters because there's a lot of, of treasury managers who want that, like banks prefer to have reserves instead of treasuries, even though functionally they're basically the same thing. Um, I, this, is a, this is a big talking point. Uh, I don't mean talking point pejoratively, but this is a big talking point in a number of quarters that the drawdown in the, in the reverse repo facility has, has compensated for the Fed's balance sheet. And sometime over the summer, this is going to come to a head and it probably will. Uh, I'll 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 push back for the fun of conversation here and say, isn't this just the latest in Fed-based fear mongering that we've heard for the better part of fifteen? But why years? couldn't they ram if if they if it turns out that the removal of the reverse repo program or the I guess the the uh, 
the diminishing size of it turns out to be disruptive to capital markets, they'll just ante back up again. Or they'll stop tightening. In plain English, right. what the f*** are we talking about? This is very, nobody knows what we're talking well, about. Well, I'll, 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 I'll give some context. Michael, let's the say influence. you have three lollipops <laughs> and Dan has no, five. No, seriously, who does this impact? Are we talking about so, the banks or uh, no, and lending? It, no, it's it just, it's it's just the, the all the money the Fed's created. It's the oxygen in the markets. And it, yeah, if you the end of QE, QE1, right after it finished. Now, the Fed, QE1, they told you how much they were going to buy and literally the date was going to end. And within three weeks of it ending, the S&P 500 started a correction of like 18%. QE2, they told you again, when how much we're buying, when it's ending. Within weeks, we had a 20% correction. Then you fast forward. You're leaving out context, but okay. Dan's about to matumble no, your I ass. I don't think that the S&P downgrade <laughs> of the US is the reason why we sell 20%. Okay, so why? What, if, if what year is that? That's the context you're thinking of. <laughs> what year is I don't this? think that was the reason. What year is this? Yeah, exactly. The, so then the QE1 QE2. ended right before the debt ceiling in 2011. Oh, we also had a currency How uh, meltdown in, in Europe, though. So, I mean, no, no, there, there, there were, there were, it was, it, I don't think it was the downgrade because who cared about the downgrade? Treasuries actually rallied after yep. the downgrade. Yeah. So, and then QE, so QE helped markets. And when they stopped, because it's just like you blow a balloon. You, you can still blow air in the balloon, but if you're blowing less air in the balloon, the balloon just starts to yeah. contract. That's all. And then Q, QT, we had a 20% correction in the market in the fourth quarter of 2018. Yeah. Then all of a sudden, he got scared. He stopped. Yeah. How good was that time, Mnuchin? Don't worry. Was, <laughs> I spoke to all the bankers. I called and everybody. Yeah, everybody. Everything's fine. fine. Yeah. And everyone's like, wait, what? Wait. Who, 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 who <laughs> said why? that? Why? <laughs> yeah. Was there a reason? Now, over time, obviously, it doesn't matter. It's not going to change how many iPhones Apple's going to sell. So it's more of a, a short-term impact. Because But you were about to talk about multiples. This has huge impact on what people are willing to pay for risk assets. Right. If well, there's a sense that the tide is going out, Multiples are not expanding in that environment. So just to, to make the multiple point, so wh I, where I would agree with Peter is to the extent that the Fed has the back of the market, has the back of the economy, it engenders a risk on environment, sure. which itself permits people to increase risk-taking behavior, move out on the concentric circles of risk, so to speak, go out of high-yield uh, IG bonds into high-yield bonds, go out of high-yield bonds into equities, et cetera, et cetera. And that behavior permits a multiple expansion. Wouldn't you so, have thought, though, that, that we would have seen that in reverse already? Given would, the amount of hikes, the amount of QT, the length of time this is going on, the rhetoric of 12 Fed heads making speeches every but month. But now, mind you, we've seen no reversal. But literally, well, what are we without ChatGPT? And I'm not even kidding. So, so first of all, I would argue more or less in favor of what you're saying. Although I will note, let's not forget that the market did sell off. The equity market did sell off 27% in 2022. Oh, like Amazon we, just lost 56%. We, we, yes. Yeah. So that, all right. So we did have it. a correction. Go. No. Sorry. No, so the market bottomed in October 2022, just as the Fed finished its last 75 basis point rate hike. The market started to say, "We've, we, yeah, maybe we'll see more rate hikes." And we did. But the pace is slowing now, and that's when the dollar topped, the stock market bottomed on that last 75 basis point rate. The market started to say, "Okay." There's light at the end of this rate hiking cycle. You, they may give us more, but so they're slowing really, it down. So, so Peter, your uh, one of your overarching ideas then about investing in the two thousand, in the twenty teens and twenty twenties is that take the Fed literally at their word. When they tell you they're going to do something, the market will react, and when it's over, you'll see the reverse of that. In terms of the people why I'm asking, we're willing to pay because if what you're saying is true. Uh, the Fed said that they were going to meaningfully tighten conditions. They failed. They failed. With housing, they did. But other Right, than that. because they, I, I, I take everything the Fed says with a grain of salt. Yeah. But the market is trying to say the Fed is slowly backing off. Yeah. Like I gave the example of the balloon. They still may be pumping money into, uh, air into that balloon, but if they're pumping less in, the, the balloon's going to contract and vice versa. The market started to say, yeah, the, the Fed may give us more hikes, but they're all of a sudden giving us less. So, so the pain point is going to start to ease up and I can start breathing again. Yeah. Uh, I think the Fed's been taken by surprise in terms of QT not having an impact of what we just talked about. Yeah. But I think that's what really got the market off its ass 
Then you throw in AI in the early part of 2023, and that just gave the market a whole new breath of fresh air. Earnings. And then, animal, addition, and then yeah. animal spirits, earnings recovering. And- Listen, I think there's no doubt that for a long period of time in 23, that obviously, the, forget no doubt, it's evidentially true, that the AI stocks were doing the lifting. I forget the exact yeah. date, but it was sometime as late as September when the equal weight was down on the year. And the S&P itself was up 9 or 10% or whatever it is. Yeah. So they're un- unquestionably true that um, leading into that fall, that that AI, quote unquote, saved the Well, the, the thing market. about AI is it, it the theme itself um, was comprised of the largest index weights of in course, both yes, the and NASDAQ and the S&P. And conceptually, it's, index, it's, yeah. it's interest rate irrelevant. What's funny is they're all buying stuff from each other to power sure, that earnings that's, growth, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, that's, is real, which is really so amazing. So this but, chart from Straight Street is showing the earnings growth estimates year over year uh, for the S&P 500, X, the MAG6, and the Magnificent 6. Tesla's not in here. And the MAG-6 were 65% year-over-year, while the rest of the index had earnings estimates that were down year-over-year. That's crazy. It's wild. And that's where all the – and that's where the – that's why if you don't get earnings growth in the second half of this year from the rest of the S&P 500, you're probably in trouble because this but, isn't going to repeat that's, itself. But that, I, that's always the case. Earnings yeah. growth is always uh, – No, but we didn't need it last year. We were fine. Uh, well, fine because you got enormous right. multiple expansion from this yeah. new idea yes. that, that exploded. Unquestionably true. But that – conveniently helped us get through the the earnings recession that we had. And now we're on the other side of it. And the problem I have with these arguments, not that you're making it or even State Street is making it, is the suggestion is there's nothing else going on but the big but the big stocks. And clearly that's not the case. And even when you step away from the second market theme, which is GLPs, aka Eli Lilly, we talked about this on air all the time. There are so many stocks that charts of which look phenomenal. Everything, industrials, materials, everything. The dark blue line is clear is is clearly indicating that the market is expecting 10% earnings growth from everything but the Mag Six. Yes. And then the Mag Six is expected to do 28, which good good luck. I wonder what <laughs> it would have been if you took out Nvidia of that green line. Yeah. M- well, much less. Yeah. But so anyway, say. if you look at this chart, that you could say, listen, I don't know where we are right now, but the first 80% of Nvidia's move was justified. Right? Like this is but listen, you'll never know what's justified. And and this is where we turn the conversation to the nineties. And I, I'm excited because I brought some some good charts. Um, at least in my opinion, I brought them, they're good charts. <laughs> but but the, the the topic now is just whether every all these stocks are in a bubble and everything else is likely to suffer. And I I can't disagree with this more. This is a point that that Dan Ives is, and, and I I think have both made on TV regularly. This idea that that all these stocks are in a bubble because earnings expectations are so high, revenue expectations are so high, I, I think the comparisons to the 90s are, are misguided in a number of respects. And if you pull up like the first, uh, first one of the 1990s charts that I have, first of all, the bubble, so to speak, the 1999-2000 bubble was after – 10 years of investment, uh, 10 years of investment, of CapEx, of of everything catching this? on. No, this is your chart about um, how much the market has rallied right now preceding. Well, what this is showing is that if we're in a bubble, this is a pretty small one, at least for the S&P 500, it's showing the, the 25% price change in five months. This is the smallest, it's happened 10 times since the 1930s, and this is the smaller than any of the previous runs. Yeah, I think if anyone in that sense compares this to the 90s, they weren't there for the 90s. because I, I, said, that, we, I said that the other day to yeah, Michael. Yeah, we started our career in the late 90s, and, and uh, Peter's a little older than me, so he's got better knowledge. But Qualcomm was up like 2,000% in the year. And Qualcomm split twice in one year. Other stock, so there's people don't, even, under- split people four don't times. even understand what that's like. Um, yeah, I agree. So skip to the next chart, not this one. Although this is a great chart also. Again, I'm biased. I brought it. But like if you weren't there for stocks going up 15, 20% a day, a, a stock IPOing and yeah. shooting up 250, I think the average internet stock ended the 1999 250% higher than where it IPO. And there were a thousand of them. And, and they were, it was all over the place. <laughs> Dan, which chart specifically just are we go to the, I, I brought some uh, we, Wall Street Journal We made them out of order. Okay, so got it, got it, got it. So like so first of all this comparison to 1999 not so new. for the, for the listener it's not tell, tell us what so we're this at. is I brought a screenshot from Jeff Summer who was in the in the mid 2010s like one of the more uh, prominent financial uh, reporters over at the New York Times and this is from the the spring of ni- uh, t- 2014 where the title of the article is in some ways it's looking like 1999 in the stock market you can say that every year you can say that and uh, believe me I could have brought more but to, to, if you go to the next screenshot just to go back to the ne- this is Floyd Norris 
who in the mid night in the mid nineties, along with Gretchen Mortensen, was like the premier financial I journalist. Floyd Norris. Yeah, Floyd, every story is Floyd Norris. This is a, a, a Market Watch, aka New York Times article. A bubble grows ever bigger from the summer of nineteen ninety five. And right. if you read this, which you can it if it's in the show notes or something, right. first of all, it hadn't even started yet. But the terminology in here, you could print this article today and it would be basically the same thing. What Floyd Norris is reacting to in 1995 is the Netscape IPO, yep. which was one of a kind. It, re- it truly was. It like, woke everybody up to it what? Wo- it, it was Andreessen. It would kick the door down to the consumer internet. It was the real thing, like in many ways. In, in many respects, it's chat GPT. Right, but that wasn't the tail end of the internet. That was like the first. So Dan, I'll give you, it was the beginning. Dan, I'll give you the mic back in a sec, but I want to read this very quick paragraph from Super Money, the Adam Smith book from like the 60s, I think. So he's talking about bubbles and stock markets and manias. He said, all right, this is Adam Smith. We are all at a wonderful ball where the champagne sparkles in every glass and soft laughter falls upon the summer air. We know by the rules that at some moment, the black horseman will come shattering through the great terrace doors, wreaking vengeance and scattering the survivors. Those who leave early are saved, but the ball is so splendid, no one wants to leave while there is still time, so that everyone keeps asking, what time is it? What time is it? But none of the clocks have any hands. And that's a great way to describe where we currently are. We all know that things are frothy, but we have no idea, is it 1 o'clock or is it 11.59? I'm sorry, I'm I'm really going right now. Um, I I, I, I can't emphasize enough. Having lived through through a few of these markets now, Peter, one more than me, um, it's impossible to tell in the moment. And let's use 05 as an example. Let's not go back to the 90s because a lot of viewers weren't there. But even in, of, in, in the 2000s bubble, the housing stocks peaked in 05. Housing activity peaked in 05. Um, home prices started falling on a month-over-month basis in 06. The financials imploded in 07. All of that, and the market still went on to make new highs in October of 2007. Yeah. It just... You had amp, the hedge fund, the uh, the when Bear Stearns hedge, hedge funds, hedge funds August 07. 07. BNP had the hedge funds so you had blow 14 up. 14 more uh, months before right. the S&P would top. Well, Bear, Bear blew up in, in spring of 08, but yeah, the hedge funds there, the hedge Bear Stearns. Funds. But Barry started buying those things in 05, I think. Who did? Michael Barry. He started buying the credit default yes. stocks in 2005. And by the way, it ended up being right. My, my point is just- And to, almost to, out of business. No, we know your so point. Early. It's, it's yeah. well taken. It, yeah. you, you, in you real time, it's really hard. It's impossible to tell in real time. And this is the 90s also. And my favorite stat about the 90s is everyone knows, everyone knows that the NASDAQ, I'm sorry, the S&P 500 peaked in March of, of, of 2000. What nobody seems to remember is that by September of 2000, it, it almost made a new high and did it on increasing breadth. The yeah. market was in better shape in September of that year. And again, even then- There was you, an echo bubble led by the optical networking stocks like JDS Uniphase. Yes, that, that, you needed- And the, the market the market rationale for that in late 2000 was these aren't pieces of shit like eToys and Pets.com. These companies have real earnings. They were coasting on the fumes of the Y2K CapEx. Sure. And they bl- eventually blew up just as spectacularly. Right, because- th- in obviously March 2000, everything fell apart. And then they started to pile in the summer, which took the market back to the highs in Sun Micro. Equipment. in Because they, they said- shipped it, They we shipped need it from be, internet and they went into equipment. Right. But then, but not thinking that, well, all their customers are blowing up. All their customers are $0 stocks now. That's is right. is Sun Micro if all their customers are disappearing? Hey, in uh, so that 2014 article that you posted, I don't know if it's mentioned in there, but I think right around the same time, end of 2013, was the infamous unicorn cover for Fortune. Oh, yeah. It was, they said there were 100 companies in Silicon Valley worth a billion dollars pre-public. And they said, this is 1999. Well, because Q, and And also said was doing QE Infinity. It's it's 11 years ago. The the rise of the unicorn, now it's like standard. Of course, there are pre-IPO, billion dollar money losing startups. That's normal to us now. It was insane to people who had lived through prior history, this idea that you could have companies not even publicly traded, losing money worth, quote unquote, on paper, billions of dollars. So we've all gotten used to something that will probably never go back the way it was before. So another problem with trying to determine what time it is, it you might be dead right that things have changed and we should notice them, but they might never go back to the way they were. There is some sobering that's going on with this higher cost of capital. In terms of if you're a small business and you want to borrow, it's going to cost you eight to twelve percent. It's you know you we don't 
doesn't show up on the front page of the Wall Street Journal about that small business that can't expand because they can't get a loan and they don't want to put a personal guarantee in, and the banks are more focused on getting rid of their commercial real estate book and not lending on anything else. Well, you but, know what looks nothing like NVIDIA? The, non, the Goldman Sachs Non-Profitable Tech Index, they're getting, they're getting destroyed. Those company, no, there's no appetite for those companies anymore. The, the VC community, you have, it's very hard to raise a new fund now if your first fund five years ago you can't sell any of the companies in it. Yeah, you growth can't, capital. You, can't, you can't, uh, can't liquidate it. To your point, small cap biotech looks like the, the, those those stocks can't get arrested. Right. Um, access to capital is tougher for these guys. Uh, remember uh, the cannabis uh, craze? Yeah. Specs. So now cannabis NFTs. is basically fully legal everywhere. Every one of those stocks is a penny. And the money that's been burned in that sector as well. Yeah, so Solar. Yeah, we just well, tiger about. capital, all their growth funds, they're gone. When people talk about how the Fed was able to raise rates by 500 basis points and there was no pain taken, any one of these categories that we're talking about is evidence of, of froth coming out of the system. Again, in the interim, you papered over the large cap trouble with the the big uh, with the big seven, so to speak. But now you're on the other side of that. And to turn it to the modern to the to the present day, you're on the other side of that right now, where the breadth is broadening. We keep talking about small caps moving higher. Mid caps obviously have made a new a new high. And and to me. And, and we talked about this repeatedly, but the fact that the S&P 500 is up 8 or 9% for the year, maybe down a little bit more, I see today, when Tesla is down 30% for the year, Apple's Apple like down 10%, and Google is basically flat, is not a miracle, but evidence that the broadening out is happening. And, and instead of lamenting that, oh, if it, we would have been down if not for the big seven, we should we should be thankful. They they rode us through to this moment where it appears like we're on the other side of it. And we don't need them anymore. The Cavs never would have well, won without LeBron James. Well, the, Not with Zadrunas Logowskis, that's for sure. I think we we the beauty of having like an Apple, Google, having that stretch of time when they led was healthy because they were such incredible businesses that yeah. had such secular growth opportunities. The building of the cloud. Right. If we shift it was a to a seven year story. If we shift to a market that's being driven by semiconductors, whether it's NVIDIA or something else, that just happens to be a more cyclical business. Yeah. It makes the market more fragile. Exactly. Yeah. Now, NVIDIA can keep on growing, who the hell knows? But it's just a more cyclical business. Whereas the secular drivers oh, that's, a, that's an interesting point. were a good money bet for a long period of time. Yeah. You know, NVIDIA, as amazing as it is, you know, their their cust their biggest customers today. And I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not talking, I don't want to talk negative about Nivea. I have no opinion. But their biggest customers today are trying to be their competitors tomorrow. It's Facebook. They're all trying to create their Meta, own Meta, Microsoft, chips. Amazon. They're all trying to build right. their own. So is, right. is Nvidia's 77% profit margin sustainable? No way. It's not. Now, again, I'm putting aside Nvidia. Just semiconductors in general, just they just happen to be cycl a cyclical business. Their booms and busts just always is the case. So I'd rather the market being driven by Apple and Google, just because of the quality of their business. I saw models. something. I saw something uh, this week that I hadn't been paying attention to for a long time, but the sector within tech that always finishes a tech rally, like rallies at the very end, and you know it's all like getting close to being over. The electronic contract manufacturer stocks. Who and is that? Like J Bill. J Bill. Look at a chart of J Bill Circuit. It's the best looking chart I've ever seen right now. Flextronics. Mm -hmm. It's now called Flex Limited. Yep. These are the companies that when Dell gets an order for a machine, the order gets forwarded from Dell to Singapore and Flex has uh, basically like uh, their own Foxconn and they just assemble it. They put it in a Dell box and ship it to Dell's customer. Dell doesn't ever handle any of the electronics. So there are maybe six or seven of these publicly traded. j is probably the best one, the blue chip of the group. It is. But I, I very distinctly remember these being the last stocks going up um, in that 99, 2000 era because they still were coasting on the fumes of all those orders. The problem right, they're is- they're at the end of the food chain. They're the caboose. So if you're listening to the guidance from J. Bill Circuit, you're already f what, what I because they don't know what's coming. They just know the orders they're getting today. What right. I find most interesting about this conversation, to your point about is, is the reason to be bearish is that nobody's bearish is that we keep having a conversation about a bubble, when it ends, look over here. Nobody, other than my quick mention about, about whether this is 95 or 99, the, the, there's very few people making, I think, the point that, that a few of us are making, which is it appears as though, and I'm no great tech investor, but it appears as though we are at the beginning of a multi-year cycle of investment in, in not just NVIDIA, but in data center, uh, and, and, and reshoring, in grid stability, in carb decarbonization. We were at that, but so here's the thing. 
How many years of demand is NVIDIA pulling forward right, right now? So both things are true. We're, we're at the beginning in, in, real, in real life. We're closer to the beginning than the end. But to Josh's point, how many years has NVIDIA pulled forward? Who the f knows? We'll but, find but out. The, the, we'll, we'll never, yes, we don't know. Now, thankfully, the stock appears to be trading at, let's call it, 30 times earnings and not the right. 100, Agreed. 150 that Oracle and Sun It is not and, an expensive stock yeah. given their competitive position yeah. and As it appears. their profitability. So, Peter, you're like this. So, the, this is from uh, Willie Delwish on Twitter. He said, the latest investors' intelligence data shows the most bulls since July 2021 and the highest bull bear spread since April 2021 and the fewest bears since February 2018. Well, that'll, that could change yeah. in one day. Yeah, yeah that, that, so I focus yeah. on that every week. It's more, it's, it, it's- But rational, it's why a, would you it's be a bearish? Mood. It's rational. Yeah, but it, no, it's, it's a measure of the mood. Yeah. And it only matters for the short term, to your point. Right. Like, it'll tell you nothing where the market's going to be a year from now. But it could tell you where the market is in uh, a month from now, that maybe that tells you that everyone's too giddy. Maybe we just need to take a breath. Dude, it's been like 90 days since we've had a 2% pullback. I think, I think it's time. Well, to your point, like, <laughs> I, I'm not a good chart person, but I know a parabolic move when I see one. And when a stock goes straight up, it's it's like if you're running and you're sprinting, eventually you need to take a break. On cocaine. You need to catch your breath. <laughs> yeah, you need to catch your breath. We're and just, when a, when saw, a stock goes straight up, NVIDIA have a negative. Uh, yeah, it's 70, it's 70, NVIDIA, 70 NVIDIA did this and then it did that. Right. So when a stock goes vertical, you have a giddy number like that. Maybe the market just needs to take a breather. Please. Well, listen, the whole SP 500 is something like 12, 13, 14% away from the 200 day moving it's a lot. average. It's a lot. And, yeah. and it's not the Another most reason. ever. It doesn't automatically mean you must go down. But often when you get that far away from the 200-day moving, as a crude way of measuring 16 of 19 straight yeah. up weeks, uh, it wouldn't be unusual to see us digest it. Maybe it's the Fed meeting next week. We could use a breather. I, I, I mean, and also Abercrombie and Fitch went parabolic. Yeah. GE went parabolic. Lilly, Nova, I mean, sure, but all good stories. And the point is, is that when a stock goes vertical, to your point, you're pulling forward a lot of future return. You guys talked about the Cisco NVIDIA comparison in your last call. In fiscal year 2000, Cisco made 57 cents a share. This year, they're supposed to make about $3.70. The stock has gone from 80 to 50. It matters. 24 what, it matters, years. It matters what price you pay. Exactly, because it, it, it pulled 25 years of earnings all in one parabolic this move. Is the only bearish thing I can think of on NVIDIA is that what if they are currently making sales to customers that they would have normally made in calendar 2026. What if they're making those right now? Are there more orders lined up behind? Or are we seeing three to five years worth of revenue packed into two quarters? I'm not saying it's definitely what's happening. I'm saying when you listen to um, the, fury, the, the, the fury with which orders are being placed, it's conceivable. Uh, what, what I will add in this conversation, and I do this on air a bunch, um, I just I want to emphasize what's going on in the industrial space. And I, I, I can't talk specific stocks, but all the focus in AI is on chips, chips, chips. It's Broadcom, it's, it's NVIDIA, et cetera, et cetera. We still have to build a data center. And last time, I, last time I checked, NVIDIA cannot actually build the data center. You have to put the yeah. racks into the data center. You have to keep the whole place cool. Like there are a, a whole lot of other companies that are that are ancillary, so to speak, to this narrative that are doing phenomenally well fundamentally that don't get virtually any attention on, on CNBC, on Bloomberg, on Fox, et cetera. And they're making new highs. To and the point. charts about, we talked yeah. earlier about, like there are other things going on here besides just NVIDIA, but related to the same topic. And I, I, I wish I could get more specific, but like it just, it doesn't get enough play and it's a shame. I want to, uh, I want to move to overseas stocks because there's a lot going on and it's like exciting again. And I know you watch uh, overseas stocks pretty much every day. And uh, you and I have talked about, like, what are the things that you think are important? So China is still a basket case. I don't know when that, if and when that will ever change. Uh, but Japan is the hottest stock market in the world. And India is the hottest emerging stock market in the world. And there's not only a lot of money being made in the stocks, but it seems that both of those governments are doing things that look on the surface to be corporate friendly, investor friendly. Uh, they seem to be encouraging uh, the stock market deliberately, politically. It seems like com countries are looking at what the United States has just had happen over the last 10 years. And they're saying, you know what, maybe there's something to that. Uh, is that, am I reading that right, do you think? Or is there, is there something else that I'm not seeing? You're absolutely right. Take Japan. Yeah. Tokyo Stock Exchange basically told half the companies that trade there that trade under book value, if you don't get your stock at or above book value, we're going to delist you. This is incredible. How did they supposed to do that? Buy back shares or what? what? 
buy back share. So AI. GLPs. <laughs> focus on earnings, improve your return on equity, <laughs> buy back shares, get rid of these cross holdings that are still much less common, but still common in, J in Japan where companies own shares of each other, become a much more efficient business. South Korea now is getting on this bandwagon. Yes. That uh, market has been trading at 10 times earnings forever. They're beginning to get religion. But the interesting thing about there's Asia- There's two things I do on an airplane, Peter. I, I drink ginger ale, nowhere else, just on an airplane. And I read articles about South Korea in The Economist. It's a really specific <laughs> These are the only plane. two things that I will do on an airplane that I won't do anywhere else. But yeah, there's a pro shareholder thing happening in all these countries because I think they realize it's what their economies need. It's, it's like it took a while, but that's bullish. The interesting thing about Asia, I mean, we're talking about half the world's population is there. Yeah. And to me- Asia for the next 10 to 20 years is the most exciting growth story in the world in terms of a growing middle class. Even in China, China's middle class is going to go from 400 million people to 800 million people over the yeah. next five to 10 years. They're going to add the population of the US in terms of middle class over the next five to 10 years. I don't years. know if you'll get the upside of that as an equity shareholder overseas, but the other countries I would buy that you can. Yeah, the Chinese love to travel. They're going to go to Japan, yeah, right. Thailand, S Indonesia, uh, Singapore. Vietnam, Singapore, India. These are all very exciting, emerging, middle-class stories. And there are ways of investing to sort of play that. Uh, and even that the Chinese spender. In 2019, the Chinese spender you know, on international uh, international travel spent $250 billion that they sprinkled around the world, whether it was shopping on Fifth Avenue or going to Paris and, and London or going to Tokyo. They bought stuff, and the wealthier they get, they want to buy more stuff, and they want to eat out, and they want to experience the same the luxury, things we are. The luxury brands are like one of the primary recipients of, of that activity. That, and even in a stock we own is AIA Group, the largest insurance companies in Asia. That was the Asian business that was spun out of AIG when AIG went bankrupt. You Growing middle class, you need life insurance. You need yeah. you know, like basic financial help that we get here. They eat more protein, they buy more clothing, they travel, exactly. stay in hotels. It's a very exciting macro story when looking out five to 10 what's years. The India what's the India story, as you understand it? it, it the growing middle class as it's, well. It's not China is what I keep hearing. Yes, but the interesting thing about that is China doesn't need another, we don't need another, a, a, a non-China because China itself is still going to be a major growth contributor. Because even if China's GDP grows 3% for the next 10 years, in terms of dollars, it's still a lot of dollars. And you combine an Indian middle class, the Chinese middle class, Indonesia's got 250 no, million no, no. people. Peter, uh, S&P 500 publicly traded companies do need another China. Apple needs another story to tell about the next billion consumers who yes. might buy an iPhone. This whole region we know is they're be not going to be in China. This whole region is going to be that. The issue that Apple faces is competing against uh, some of the Chinese Xiaomi phones and, that are yeah, selling yeah. phones in India for $10. That's right. Because they want to get them on, because Android costs nothing. That's the problem Apple faces, is being able to sell cheap phones to someone who's making $3,000 per you capita. But you hear Netflix talking about India in a way that 10 years ago, Netflix, Disney were all about China. How do we get movies to open big in China? How do we get these Marvel movies on 3,000 screens, 5,000 screens in China? It's all India now. And look at the deal that Disney just, Disney, they were thought that Disney may actually exit 100% from the India business. People said, you'd be crazy giving up that market. That's right. Here, here they are. They sold out a piece, but they are a big shareholder of, um, hot of, star. of, of the hot star. That yeah. it's a major market that someone else can run for them. Right. Okay. So it's fun again, being an international investor. I could believe you, so. Could you guys conceive of a scenario, 2024, where many large overseas markets do better than the S&P 500 for the first time in a long time? I, th I think the, the pro argument would be that that investments move in waves and the U.S. has been clearly the outperformer the the for only the better wave. part of 20. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, the U.S. has been the star performer for 20 years. And if you're going to have uh, anything resembling history, then the U.S. is going to start to underperform. That wouldn't be an unusual development. I think that's probably the most cogent pro example. I mean, the, pro the problem I have with that is just at least for the immediate future, the U.S. economically uh, and, and earnings-wise continues to be far superior to, to most global markets. Now, the, the counter to that is that all the other markets are meaningfully cheaper. 
But the counter to that is uh, they don't have any good companies. Too many counters. <laughs> well, no. so, so India printed an 8.4% GDP number for Q4. That's incredible. Nobody knows that. Nobody's paying attention to that here. People but, but, are riding the stock market momentum. I don't think anyone's become like an India, right? Do you hear anybody that knows what they're talking now, about? Now, that market Modi. has actually done well. <laughs> Modi, yeah. The, the market's not cheap anymore. The market has done well. Yeah. So uh, in the short term, a lot of that easy money has been had. But looking out five to 10 years in terms of looking at global growth, certainly not going to get it out of Europe. Uh, it's going to be more let's put, this, let's put this chart up, John. Uh, the, th the three country markets, just for context, Wisdom Tree Japan hedged equity, which is Wisdom Tree's DXJ. It eliminates the yen impact. Uh, it's doubled. And this is back to uh, summer of 21. Years. Three years. Okay. Uh, India up 26%. China down, cut in half. So will this look, do you think, substantially similar by the end of 2024? I, I think Chinese stocks have a, has, has a way, have, has the, a lot of potential here of catching up. They just fired their uh, head of securities regulation in China. They're doing some things to signal that they want the stock market to go up. Everything they can to get the stock market up. You think it'll work? Now, Chun has tweeted this morning, the Chinese government has gone full BOJ. They purchased $45 billion of ETFs in the past two months to public market, already owns a fifth of all equity ETFs. They can move to buying small caps, because, whatever. You get the point. So what do you do? I particularly like stocks in the hang your, You just close your eyes and 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 buy what red chips. So I'm playing it within that theme of the growing middle class. Okay. So stocks in Macau, okay. Las Vegas Sands, Melco. You can buy here. I mentioned AIE Group, Trip.com, which is the largest online and, uh, travel agency in Asia. As they, you know, some of them trade on the Hang Seng, so you can benefit from that because a lot of the companies on the Hang Seng are going to benefit from growth in the entire region not just China. People think it's just a China play, Will the but New it's a York regional Stock Exchange play. traded uh, internet giants work, or are they still going to be in I the believe so. Box? They're just too damn cheap. Okay. The JDs. And the Alibabas. And I mean, the Alibabas. You want to talk about who's, who, who, who's a good play on that growing middle class, it's them. But hasn't Alibaba been cheap for 10 years? Yes. But when you think about everything that's been thrown at it, you can understand that multiple degradation with China government basically going after them. And but Qu that, questions about whether or not the listing here would even survive. be allowed to continue. Right. You've gone it's from extreme exuberance to extreme, I think, bearishness. And that's what happens in bull markets. Multiples expand and bear markets, they contract. And you've contracted them to such an extent that the Hang Seng, I think, trades at seven and a half or eight times earnings and has a dividend yield of almost 5%. Google, I'm sorry, Bloomberg tells me Bob is trading at eight times forward. Oof. Uh, TikTok ban. And they're growing, right? TikTok ban went through in uh, the house. And now it has to go through the Senate, which seems less likely, That'd but tougher. But likely, uh, 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 not likely, not like unlikely. Uh, un, un, right now, Dis, listen, what you say is dislikely. Is dislikely a word? <laughs> no, no. Uh, so, 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 yes, it passed the House. Uh, the prospects in the Senate are more challenged. Okay. Um, and have now that said, I think there have been surprises on Chinese legislation the last couple of years where things have passed to a larger degree and more quickly than than political forecasters have expected. For and my it, benefit, what, what's, the, what's the story here? So we're trying to eliminate TikTok for, for political reasons, two China's issues. interference, the, or what two, exactly? Two issues. The first is uh, data, that, that obviously TikTok has access to Americans' data. And then the second is political interference. And that really took a step up after, after what happened on October 7th, where a lot of politicians feel like there was one study that showed that, uh, and I'm making no comment whatsoever about uh, anything about October 7th other than what was revealed. Uh, and there was one report that showed that pro-Palestinian comment uh, uh, content on TikTok was 60 times, 69 times more likely to be seen than uh, pro-Israeli content. And now you might say, well, TikTok is disproportionately younger users who are probably going to lean in that direction regardless. I, I, again, I'm making no comment one way or the other, but my understanding is that politicians interpreted that data as being an issue to deal with. It so was. It's not true that younger people were necessarily going to lean in that direction. 20 years ago, there, there was an intifada in the Middle East, uh, maybe 22 years ago, and we did not have anywhere near the amount of uh, pro-Palestinian sentiment that we do today. So when they looked around to try to figure out why, they looked at college campuses and they looked at uh, social media. But what about Reels? Is Reels the same? Does Reels show the same thing? Uh, I have not seen any study on Reels that but was Reels comparable. Is not but, owned, but Reels is not, not controlled owned. by a foreign government. I get it. I, get it. I, I, I just want to add the final kicker here is 
if there's a disturbance with Taiwan, I use disturbance lightly, but if there's a disturbance with Taiwan, a lot of uh, politicians in Washington are concerned about China's ability yeah. to uh, try to shape American opinion in the lead up to a Rus- disturbance. And Russia, or- and Russia, Ukraine, is it's, it's, it's a similar concern. All right, so you have these two concerns. What TikTok did when Trump was trying to, when Trump was going after it, he probably wanted to own it for himself. What they did was this thing called Project Texas, where they moved, allegedly, <laughs> they claim they moved all of the U.S. user data to literally Texas, and it's called Project Texas, and they claim it's on Oracle servers on U.S. soil and that no one in China can actually access it. It's a U.S. subsidiary managing the U.S. The business. rebuttal to that is when— Nobody believes it. No, I'm yeah, just telling when, you. <laughs> when, China, when China says to TikTok, send me the data, the U.S. subsidiary is just going to say— That is the argument in Washington. Now, Trump was demanding that they sell it to a U.S.-based company, and we had a lot of really weird shit go on. Like, all of a sudden, Oracle was interested, um, and Oracle was their biggest vendor. Walmart threw their hat in the ring. It was really interesting. Now Caterpillar. We're seeing- <laughs> yeah, yeah. Kind of. Now we're seeing something similar. The guy uh, that ran Mnuchin yeah. has a consortium. The guy that ran Activision, Bobby Kotick, he claims he's got a consortium behind him to buy it. Well, listen, 20% of social media use is on TikTok. It's I mean, huge. It's an, oh, it's huge. Wow. We have, um, I brought a chart. I didn't bring the chart. Someone brought the chart uh, about uh, uh, like the use on TikTok is longer and more prominent. Let's put that up, than, John. Than all the other services. Uh, like this is a real business. Holy U.S. Shit. daily time spent per daily average user in minutes, ninety four minutes. TikTok, yeah. That YouTube sounds- is seventy eight. Snapchat is nineteen. Uh, Instagram is sixty. People spend an hour. Users spend an hour. My and kids, a half a day. my kids spend maybe two or three hours on TikTok. They never stop. If they get into an elevator, they can't stand still for one second. The phone comes out, and they're not in Instagram. They're in, t- they're in TikTok. So why would Caterpillar be interested in <laughs> yeah, TikTok? Yeah. Why wouldn't they be? Because yeah. you have an enormous dedicated user base. The 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 bill passed the House today, 352 to 65. So Which that's, bi- an enormous that's bipartisan. Yeah. Uh, why do you think it's going to be so much di- more difficult than the Senate? Uh, well, listen, the Senate is by design since the country is founding – uh, the analogy is always that it's the the, the saucer on which the cup of tea is cooled. It's, yeah, it's they all, need sixty votes for that. Uh, well, to get through a, to, uh, a what, filibuster, they, sure. Um, but uh, but uh, the, 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 like all you need to do is look no further than Chuck, what Chuck Schumer had to say when asked about it. He said, "Yeah, we'll review what the House said." This like, is uh, all right. This is this is the uh, all right. There's a twenty five percent possibility. That TikTok gets banned in the United States. Are those based on CME futures? No, this is Dan Ives. This is Dan Ives. Uh, he he pegs it at 25%. Um, assuming the bill is approved at all levels, ByteDance would have six months yeah. to fully divest its U.S. TikTok operations to another non-Chinese entity. And, it, you know, better be United States. The reason why this is relevant is TikTok's most recent valuation is $267 billion. Sounds they light. offered to buy shares back from people who own it, like Sequoia and other U.S., right? So the question is, if it becomes a U.S.-based company, ostensibly it would be public pretty quickly. This would be another potential MAG-6 name because if it were unrestrained by any political concerns and it was a U.S.-based business, you could see this going from $267 billion to $500 billion. In a year. It could happen in a month. I think I read today that they do about $6 billion of ad revenue right yeah. now, TikTok. Yeah. <laughs> and that they said if Meta bought them, well, well the government's, not, Meta, gonna, Meta, no, the government's not going to allow that, but That'll it would be such happen. a small piece. It would be like 3% of Meta's revenue. Yeah. Now, why would the Senate strike this down? Would this be viewed as like an act of aggression towards China? Well, first of all, Rand Paul's. No, First Amendment. Yeah, Rand Paul's uh, a pretty And, and setting up. a bad precedent of well, just but, wait, getting rid so, of. So that's a good point. Think about this in reverse. If Russia did this to a U.S. company or China did this to a U.S. company, we would be screaming. First of all, you, right. the, our social media companies can't exist in China. I know, but if a company if a company was currently in existence in China, as many are, and all of a sudden the Chinese said Coca Cola must sell its Chinese operations to a Chinese company right now, think about the response here. We would be going absolutely. Just, right. just think shit. of any all our energy assets that have been nationalized around. And the some world. people say, you know what? If you don't want to be surveilled on TikTok, don't use it. 
if you want to show dance videos and you don't mind the Chinese watching, then go ahead. He's yeah. daring you, uh, Michael, not to dance. No, on I'm TikTok saying that, that that's some people are saying. Like, if if you don't, if you're worried about the national security and the surveillance thing, then use some other social media platform. Uh, where are I the, only dance on Pinterest. Where are the dip buyers in uh, for Tesla? Why didn't they show up this time? I think if the dip buyers need to come in when sales stop slowing down, you need a bottoming in their sales growth rate. I don't think they're. That's there not yet. happening right now. Uh, Wells that, Fargo that is now predicting is so fat still. negative sales growth for Tesla. This is the first time we've seen that. Well, this gets back to a margin of safety. You don't have any valuation support when fundamentals turn to the downside. So uh, Bailey Gifford, Kathy, Ron Barron, are any of them buying? I feel like Kat, for ARC, it used to be like 12%, 14 maybe. It's now seven. I asked Sean this question. Barron bought 40,000 shares of Tesla in Q4, which... Uh, is about 0.25% of Tesla overall. Um, Bailey Gifford was a net seller of Tesla through Q4. But it was it was fine in Q4. I want to see what it did in Q1. They sold 16% of their stake, though, in, in Q4. But Q4 was fine-ish. ARK was a seller in Q4 also. I want to see I don't Q1. Have, I don't have Q1 I know, yet. I know, I know. You're going to have to wait. John, some charts, please. ARK sold 276,000 shares last quarter. About 7% of its stake in... Uh, so these are the largest shareholders, though. That's why I bring them up. Tesla is 12% uh, uh, of Barron Funds, 4% of Bailey Gifford. It's their sixth largest holding. And it's still 7% of the ARC flagship. It's their third largest It holding. was a $1.24 trillion market cap at the peak in January 2022. And it's under, it's about $500 billion And that today. previous chart you just had up was, was Peter's point. Go back. So, so yeah, it's fundamentally, it's not great. What's changed, though, also for Tesla is I don't think the Tesla bulls forecasted how hot hybrids are right now. Hybrids. Hybrid cars. Is, is well, someone well, well, they don't make those. Right. I think a year What's ago- What's the hottest hybrid? I'm not sure, but I'm saying like a year ago, people just assumed it's either internal combustion versus EV. Oh, uh, that's interesting. You know, yeah, to Toyota kept saying, hey, you got to give hybrids a chance. Now hybrids are actually gaining a lot of traction. I don't think the Tesla Duncan, bulls what hybrids thought are people, what hybrids the hybrids are people would buying? catch on. I don't know. I don't really follow hybrids. I also feel like Elon hasn't been that vocal about Tesla, like if, if about the stock. If he if he wasn't doing what he's doing on Twitter, he'd be much louder, don't you think? I think that's probably right. But but to Peter's point, I don't think this can be said enough. Like there was a a forecast for EV demand that and to be clear, people still want EVs. Just demand is not ramping up nearly as quickly as was forecast. And so the idea that we're going to go full EV, so to speak, by 2035 or, or 2040, some of the forecasts is, is uh, proven proven uh, probably to be too optimistic. The, the hybrid um, uh, uh, bridge, if you will, is is something that wasn't anticipated and is is really – screwing up the the EV forecast and every you know, to, to your point about Toyota they were sort of the only ones that were out there saying guys hold on a minute and they obviously are, are, have been rewarded everyone else threw through their hat in so to speak with with what is unquestionably a money losing business at least for right now and the big problem for a lot of these stocks of course is if if Trump uh, wins election again what does that mean for the, um, the, sub the subsidies what does that mean for the subsidies what does it mean for the inflation it reduction depends Act? who contributes to his uh his legal fund <laughs> you know what I mean? The subsidies come back real fast. Uh, all right, we're gonna we're gonna leave it there. Did you guys have fun on the show today? A blast. How long how long is this? this? As long as it needed to be. As long as it needed to be. That's uh, that's average. You guys are you guys, as I said, are two of the smartest people I know. I so appreciate you coming. Wait, don't here. we have to do this the exit questions? Are we yeah, doing well, questions? Gonna, I promised I, Michael a stock pick just for him. Okay, I'm I'm, I'm excited. Pitch us. So Madison Square Garden Sell me this Sports. Pants. I swear to God, I thought you were saying MSG. Okay, go ahead. Okay, MSG S. That's a, which has its own ticker. Is that the Sphere? Its own ticker. No, no oh, it only the owns the Knicks and Rangers. The enterprise value is about four point six billion. Forbes values the Knicks at six point six billion. Rangers two point two billion. You're selling past the close. So for four point six billion, <laughs> you get eight point eight billion. But how value. do you ever realize that value? He's never going to sell it. He's never going to sell. However. Yes, it is. He may never sell until he dies. Oh, he will never sell. No, we got to catch him with the sex scandal. He's in his 50s, no? He's late 60s. Late? But Jim Dolan is late hey, What 60s? if JD yeah. the straight shot catches on? Well, that's a risk. They, that's are, a risk. they, are, they are talented. But what he's done for, for the sphere, you know, yeah. it was always the Dolan discount. Yeah. People are blown away by the sphere. And he's he's the guy behind the sphere. But the sphere has its own ticker. It's not yeah. his asset. No, my, my point was is that Dolan's reputation sorry, is being actually- 
revitalized with the sphere. So maybe that valuation spread could shrink. I don't hate it. I've been listening. Give, give I've me been, applause. I've been listening to uh, I've been listening to Mario Gabelli pitch this stock since it existed. Yeah. I think. I don't, he I don't, has, yes. I don't know about I, this I, one. I, 10 years, we can be having the same conversation. Now, I wanted to end, because last time I came unprepared for a book or something, and one of the- Favorites. Yes. The fa yes, I was you unprepared last one. time. Okay. Well, well, this time I came prepared. It was Let's the go. favorite show or something that I'm watching. And I want to say, publicly on air, I have never been more jealous of a human being in my entire life than I was of Ryan Gosling the other <laughs> night. Oh, dude. <laughs> Which part? So it's just the whole thing. It just owns the <laughs> world. The performance right yeah, yeah. was, I'm, I'm, I'm shakingly jealous at, at how cool he was, how cool he looked, how good it was. The whole, and he laughed. And before. had Slash and Wolfgang Van Halen. Behind Margot him. Robbie behind him. No, no, no. Staring Billie, at the back of his head. Billie Eilish was behind him laughing. Yeah. Margot Robbie was in front of him laughing. Oh, uh, okay. He laughed four different times when he punched, when he fake punched the bass player in the face. Yeah. I, I, I just wanted to say publicly, uh, I'm not often quite uh, this enamored with another human being, and I was of him. I knew so, when I saw him in Remember the Titans that he was destined for greatness. So, uh, we, Duncan, what did I say yesterday? We were talking about, like, he's like the guy in high school that all the girls love. So you want to hate his guts, but then you hang out with him, and actually he's funny, and he's cool. Damn it, he's and nice. And you're like, oh, nice my, guy. oh, my God, I can't even hate this guy? That's like that's like what I think his rep is at I this think, point. I think that's probably right. Yeah, I, and you know, and you know from that, you know other people that are of that ilk. I, I, I can we talk about it? Who are we talking about? Uh, your friend Adam. Okay. Uh, every every girl is in love with him, and he's also insanely talented, is, and he's also cool. I went Adam Levine. I went to an acting camp. Uh, well, yes, uh, yes. First Adam Levine all, was uh, acting. Crowd is very excited to hear about the acting camp. Go ahead. There, there were other people. Zoe Deschanel went to the camp. I don't know if I'm speaking out of school either. Did you have scenes with uh, Zoe? I was never in a play. I was in a, was I in a band with Adam? I played basketball with Adam. Yeah. Uh, you we, said he was a great athlete. The he, girls loved him. We knew when we were 14. You knew he, he was, was a star. He was, uh, yeah. uh, he was, he was going to be something. He, he clearly had talent. Yeah. Um, and also a really nice guy. <laughs> well, that's the problem, right? And he's a good guy. Dude, uh, we, we were friends. He <laughs> yeah, was yeah. point guard. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, that's a great favorite. You really you came ready to bring it. Costly. My favorite was the o the Oscars too. My whole family watched it, and we're two for two now. We What's all watched the other one. We all watched the Grammys together. I mean, my wife, who doesn't care about music uh, or movies, watched both. My kids, who have never put on network television, they watched both. And there was something in the Oscars for everybody to like be like, let's keep watching. Yeah, listen, viewership so. for the Oscars was up. Uh, linear television is obviously in secular decline, and there's no avoiding that. Yeah. But uh, if you're going to bring out the Gosling, you're going to you're going to bring out the viewers. I think it had this combination of like Oppenheimer and Barbie were both so oh, big, it was Barbie. and they were yeah. getting a lot of awards. Um, although Barbie won nothing. Barbie got shut out. I think yeah, Barbie they won did not win. Uh, I think Barbie won like a production design. Dude, I can't believe no, no, they didn't. The poor things stole their thunder. Poor things won a lot also. But like, I can't believe they couldn't find one stupid thing to get Margot on stage to hand her. Uh, or, or Greta, the director. Like you can't she find one award. She wasn't even nominated. And it's it's incredible to me. Why is it incredible? I, uh, I don't know. It's one award. I got to be honest. It was the, it was honestly it was a cultural moment, the likes of which the United States really hasn't seen, and it was global, and it was a huge money maker. And this is why America hates these award shows because they're giving awards to things that nobody has seen. So now you have this thing that is both a contender in ten categories has huge movie stars in it, and Americans actually got up off their asses and went to a theater. You can't find one f***ing award to give these people. And one of the great American brands, Holy Barbie. shit, what are we doing here? Anyway, uh, I'm not that upset about it. Uh, Michael, <laughs> what do you have for us on favorites? Uh, you we're seeing Dune after this, which I'm very excited about. I yes. rewatched, I was telling these guys before, the second watch of Dune was so much better for me personally, because I had no idea the first time I watched Dune. I'm trying to keep up, and I was like, anyway, the second time, you just enjoy it. Very good movie. Excited for tonight. But what I have for the audience today is the gentleman. Guy Ritchie did a movie, I don't know, probably three years ago. Uh, and it's he turned into a TV series. So it's like dark comedy. Uh, it's great. The dude from White Lotus. The What's the lead. best Guy Ritchie movie? The be I mean, most Snatch. people would say Snatch. Yeah. Um, I think that was the yeah, last that people made like. his career. Snatch was great. Yeah. Anyway, the gentleman on Netflix, quite good. Uh, John Carlo Esposito's in it. Uh, who's like one of the best TV actors now, like over the last, like Breaking Bad. And then he's just had a run. They put him in a Star Wars show. 
Was he a Mandalorian? He was yeah. a Mandalorian. So the dude he's from he had a show on, on Channel 4 also if, when all the power went out. Yes. Uh, I forget what it was called, but that was good as well. Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm excited to, to watch that show. It's quite British and quite good. Uh, Peter, Peter, got a favorite? So it took, took my wife and I 10 years, but we finally watched the first season of True Detective. Okay. Did you binge and it? And we binged I it. I just rewatched it. And the acting was phenomenal. Yeah. It's, Matthew it's, McConaughey was unbelievable. It holds up really well. It really did. You know what I think? It was so good that it's it was impossible good. to make another one that would be just as good. I think the Rotten Tomatoes number got cut in half in season two, so I don't even know if I'm going to waste my time. Don't, don't, don't. Go, but watch season four with Jody, though. There's, oh, yeah, I heard that was— There's okay. so much yeah. good TV. I don't know why you would waste time on anything except— the best, best, a best. I agree with that. Something. I'm, not, I'm giving shows like one or two episodes. If it's not the best thing I've ever seen, yeah, I'm just going to go suck. back and watch something from the past. Prioritizing our watching habits. Yeah, we don't have much yeah. time left, you, you and I. Yeah, you know what That's I mean. Right. It's not forever. <laughs> Peter and I have like college age kids. It's not. It's not forever. All right, we're going to wrap up from there. Thank you so much to our special guests, Peter Bookvar. Dan Greenhouse and his cousin, are, Dan got, and, and his cousin, uh, and you guys are big TikTok uh, users. What are your TikTok handles for the for the audience? I don't you want to No, okay. All right. Hey, everybody! Make sure to leave us a rating and review. Thank you so much for listening. We love you. We'll see you next week. <laughs>